by introducing. Hi, everyone. So um, welcome. Uh, my name is Luba Rafi. I'm the deputy director of the Family Law Project at the Manhattan Family Justice Center for uh, Sanctuary for Families. And today's webinar is the first part in a three part series during which we'll be discussing the current state of reproductive health and justice in the post Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case that was uh, decided by the Supreme Court in June of 2022. Uh, today's webinar will concern reproductive justice issues as they pertain to New York State in particular. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on November 18th with uh, local New York City speakers and another on December 8th with the Center for Reproductive Rights and the National Advocates for Pregnant Women um, on the national landscape. And we'll have registration materials available shortly for both of those. This event is co-sponsored by Sanctuary for Families. So I'll say just a couple of words about us. Uh, Sanctuary for Families is New York's leading service provider and advocate for survivors of domestic violence, sex trafficking, and related forms of gender violence. Uh, every year, Sanctuary empowers over 10,000 adults and children to move from fear and abuse to safety and stability, transforming lives through a comprehensive range of services, which include legal representation, counseling, economic empowerment, shelter, programming for children and for families. Informed by work with thousands of survivors, Sanctuary is a leading advocate for legislation and public policies that promote freedom from gender violence as a basic human right. About three years ago, we started having a conversation that access to abortion, access to reproductive health is, uh, is a form of, uh, or rather restrictions of those rights are a form of gender-based violence in itself. So Sanctuary has expanded its mission to also include any form of reproductive abuse. So we are thrilled to continue to see this collaboration um, and without further ado, I'm honored to introduce to you our speakers for today, Jenna Lauder, who is an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the New York Civil Liberties Union, and Ali Bohm, who is a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. So feel free to type your questions as they arise into the webinar chat. We'll have approximately 10 minutes after the substantive part of the program is over to answer these questions. So please just type them in and I will read them out to Ali and to Jenna um, as I get them towards the end. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. And thank you all for being here. Um, so perhaps I should start by saying a little bit about the NYCLU. Uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union is the New York State affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. We are a not-for-profit nonpartisan organization with eight offices across the state and over uh, one that, uh, 180,000 members and supporters. Clearly, I did not practice reading numbers out loud. The NYCLU defends and promotes the fundamental principles and values embodied in the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution, and the New York State Constitution through an integrated program of litigation, legislative advocacy, public education, and community organizing. Jenna and I are both on the uh, policy side, the legislative advocacy side. And so we are gonna talk a little bit about what New York has been up to both in the lead up to the Dobbs case and in its aftermath legislatively and administratively. Um, as, as the introduction said, I'm Allie Bohm. I'm a policy counsel here at the NYCLU. I use she, her pronouns. Um, so to start us off, New York has always been a leader when it comes to access to abortion. We legalized abortion in 1970, three years before Roe v. Wade. And we ran billboards on the borders advertising that abortion was safe, legal, accessible, and available here in New York. Unfortunately, we saw the Dobbs case coming, or we saw the fall of Roe coming, whether it was through Dobbs or through another vehicle, and we've been preparing for it. So in 2019, we passed the Reproductive Health Act. The Reproductive Health Act removed abortion from our criminal code and put it into the public health law where it belongs. It quote unquote, codified Roe v. Wade. It also made clear that advanced practice clinicians, that means nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and licensed midwives can provide abortion care within their scope of practice. This was aimed at expanding uh, the provision of care and access to care in New York State. But we didn't stop there because we know that legal abortion 
is not and never has been enough to guarantee access to abortion. So in this year's budget, we passed, we required private insurers who are, co- who are regulated in New York State to provide coverage for abortion with no cost sharing and with no reason-based limits. I should just hang a flag here and say that Medicaid already covers abortion care um, and has for a long time. In May, uh, the Department of Health released guidance that interprets several aspects of the Reproductive Health Act. Uh, Many of those were uh, aimed at supporting the provision of later care. So they defined commencement of pregnancy to begin an implantation, and they defined health broadly. And I'll actually read out this definition. It's similar to the Medicaid definition to give you a sense of how New York is thinking about health when it comes to abortion care. For determining whether an abortion is necessary to protect the health of the patient, the department has identified the following categories of factors that should be considered. Physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and age of the patient. Any factor within these categories may be considered relevant to the well-being of, I'm sorry, the well-being or health of the patient and should be taken into consideration by healthcare providers when making abortion determinations related to protecting patient health. The guidance also, and importantly, addressed young people's access to abortion care. Prior to Dobbs, young people's access to abortion care in New York hung on federal case law. That case law went the way of the dinosaurs when the Dobbs decision came down. So in anticipation of the overturning of Roe, the Department of Health guidance that I just mentioned also makes clear that young people in New York have an independent right to consent to abortion under Public Health Law 2504, which is the general consent provision, and under the Reproductive Health Act, which is 2599 of the Public Health Law. If folks are interested in hanging out in the weeds there, I'm happy to explain in the Q&A where that rationale comes from, and also a little bit more um, about the federal case law, but the short version on the federal case law is the Supreme Court had found that requiring a young person to involve their parents in abortion care for some young people, particularly those who come from unsafe families, which I imagine is something you all um, are experts in, requiring parental involvement would be an unsurmountable uh, burden for people to, for young people to be able to seek care. And so, so states did have to have another way for young people to seek care, either judicial bypass, which we do not have in New York, or um, allowing young people to consent directly. So that's what happened before the Dobbs decision. But then when the Dobbs opinion leaked, legislators got together to pass a provider, patient, helper, and seeker protection package at the very end of the legislative session. And I'm going to pause here and turn it over to my colleague, Jenna, to talk more about that package. Thanks, Ali, and um, it's good to be with all of you today. Um, So in June, New York passed into law four protection bills that are aimed at shielding providers, patients, seekers, and helpers, including both individuals and abortion funds, from facing consequences as a result of care they provided to patients traveling to New York from states where abortion is restricted or banned. These laws strive to protect all participants in abortion care. So that includes the provider, the patient, or the person seeking to end their pregnancy, and the people or institutions who are supporting them, like the abortion and logistical funds, or even individuals like babysitters, Uber drivers, or family members. Now, it's important to emphasize at the outset that these laws only constrain New York actors. They don't prevent other states from attempting to impose civil or criminal liability on New York providers, patients, seekers, or helpers, nor do they prevent those states from going directly to private companies like Facebook, Google, or Verizon to seek information about abortion care performed in New York. That being said, these laws are important for ensuring that the machinery of New York courts and law enforcement is not put to use to facilitate other states' criminalization or punishment. The hope here is that we can throw sand in the gears of other states' prosecutions to make the process more difficult and ideally unsuccessful. So these laws fall into four main buckets, protecting providers' licensure, protecting their access to medical malpractice insurance, 
shielding against criminal prosecution by other states, which includes extradition protection and other measures to prevent or limit cooperation with other states' investigations. And lastly, a civil countersuit provision. So I am going to walk through each of these protections one by one um, and just bear with me. Feel free to post you know, questions in the chat or save them for Q&A. Uh, so the first provision uh, protects provider, New York providers, licensure, um, and protects them from professional discipline. So New York may not, under this law, revoke, suspend, or annul a provider's license simply because they provided, performed, or recommended reproductive health services under New York law to a patient who hails from a state where that service might be illegal. So for the purposes of this law, reproductive health services include not only abortion, but also emergency contraception, medical surgical, counseling, or referral services related to the human reproductive system, including services related to pregnancy or termination of a pregnancy. So it's a, a relatively broad protection. New York may also not revoke or deny under this law an application for licensure because of a provider's disciplinary history in another state where that discipline was based solely on the provider's legal provision of abortion care under New York law. Uh, if the board or the Office for Professional uh, Medical Conduct receives a report based on any of these activities, they're just prevented from conducting an investigation beyond a preliminary review. So in other words, providers who are licensed in New York and provide abortion care legally in the state will not face professional discipline in New York, regardless of where their patients come from, and even regardless of what other states' medical boards might do in response to their provision of abortion care. That being said, this law explicitly does not give providers license to act beyond the scope of their practice or to practice in states where they're not licensed, which, you know, it's uh, pretty uh, straightforward. So the second uh, law in this protection package uh, protects medical malpractice insurance. So it protects providers from adverse action by a New York medical malpractice insurer where the adverse action is undertaken because they provide abortion or reproductive health care that's legal in New York on someone who's from another state, including even by means of a lawful telehealth practice. So for the purposes of this law, adverse action includes, but is not limited to, rate increases, coverage losses, or other unfavorable changes in coverage terms. This protection even goes further and prevents insurers from reporting practices that may be considered a violation of other states' abortion laws. So the idea behind these two pieces of the protection package is that New York abortion providers who are serving patients from other states should feel confident that they won't face uh, professional discipline or lose their medical malpractice coverage in New York because they you know, undertake to seek patients who are coming from states where abortion might not be legal. So the third piece of the protection package is probably the most robust um, and has gotten the most attention. And this is a series of protections that aim to make it more difficult for other states to criminally prosecute providers, seekers, and helpers by preventing New York courts and law enforcement from facilitating investigation or prosecution. This includes several provisions, so I'll walk through them one by one. The first is extradition. So the bill prohibits, or the law I should say now, prohibits New York from extraditing a New York provider to a state where they're charged with providing an abortion. Um, and I, I use that term providing an abortion because that's currently what the law protects. Um, it only as written applies to that specific charge and doesn't capture the other charges that a provider might face, such as you know, under aiding and abetting or conspiracy statutes, or even potentially something as serious as murder in another state. That being said, in the bill signing, Governor Hochul and the legislature agreed to make a chapter amendment that will expand the bill's protections to cover a much broader range of charges and conduct. So just uh, putting a flag there that, you know, we hope to see that change made very quickly when the legislature reconvenes in January. It's also important to note when we're talking about extradition that ultimately federal law sets out certain requirements that limit states' discretion. So if an individual under federal law is considered a fugitive, so if they were present in the state that's seeking extradition when the alleged offense was committed and then subsequently fled that state, presence and flight, those are the two components, um, New York under federal law would be required to extradite that person. So as with all of these protection laws, 
um, you know, this really, this protection is, is designed to protect people who provide, seek, you know, obtain or assist with reproductive health care that is provided physically in New York State. Um, one last, uh, you know, limit that I think it's important to note with this protection is that it only binds New York, um, as do all of these laws. So other states, federal law enforcement, like Customs and Border Patrol, could still theoretically comply with an extradition warrant. Um, so if a provider leaves New York, travels through another state, or tries to travel internationally, and there is an extradition warrant out for them, there's a possibility that they could still risk arrest and extradition. Um, and I just say this to remind everyone that these shield laws, you know, while they are important, um, they are not fully insulating and they really just operate to ensure that New York itself is not complicit in effectuating punishment for abortion. So the second piece within this third um, part of the package is a prohibition on arrest. So the law prohibits police officers from arresting anyone because they performed, aided in, or procured a lawful abortion in New York. And again, this only applies to New York law enforcement officers and not to the officers of other states. Third is a prohibition on law enforcement cooperation with other states' investigations. Um, so law enforcement are prohibited with cooperating prohibited from cooperating with another state's investigation into lawful New York abortion, or from providing any information to an individual or out-of-state agency or department regarding a lawful abortion performed in New York. Um, so that's, you know, a pretty important aspect of this, um, this package that law enforcement are not to facilitate another state seeking information from New York. The only exception to this, um, and it's very narrow, is where law enforcement is required to comply with a valid subpoena or warrant. Um, but you know, without going into too much detail here, other states can't address search warrants directly to New York law enforcement officers, uh, nor can another state's law enforcement just come into New York and execute a search warrant. So that warrant exception is extremely narrow. And you know, as we'll talk about next, uh, this law also prohibits domestication of out-of-state subpoenas. So Despite this exception being written in, it's hard to really think of a scenario where it would come into play. Um, it's also just worth noting one other exception, which I think is relatively common sense, that this law, of course, does not prohibit law enforcement from investigating actual criminal activity, which is criminal under New York's own laws, even if it may involve an abortion, as long as no information relating to an individual patient's medical procedure is shared. So the last piece in this third um, sort of uh, protection against criminal prosecution law is a uh, protection against New York courts and county clerks, clerks domesticating subpoenas from other states. So for any non-lawyers here, a subpoena is a legal tool that requires a person to appear in court and testify or otherwise produce information to a court. Failure to comply with the subpoena could result in fines or potentially even in arrest. In New York, subpoenas coming from other states must be reissued by a New York court, county clerk, or licensed attorney in order to be valid here. So in other words, they have to be domesticated. This law would prevent New York from domesticating subpoenas that are connected to another state's proceeding related to legal abortion care performed in New York. There is a carve out here designed to protect patients who want to seek redress for something that New York also recognizes as a wrong. So New York can still domesticate a subpoena if it relates to an out of state proceeding that is a tort contract or statutory dispute that's brought by the patient who received the reproductive health care, and that would be similarly valid under New York law. And so just to zoom out a little bit, you know, the overall goal of this subpoena protection is really to limit a hostile state court's access to information or witnesses that could be used to further a prosecution. So again, you know, it is an attempt to put sand in the gears of that prosecution and just make it more difficult for the prosecution to make their case. Um, so the last uh, law in this protection package is a bill that would allow recovery through civil countersuits. This essentially creates the ability for people to sue someone who has sued or prosecuted them in a hostile state because of their involvement in legal abortion care in New York. 
So in the circumstance that an abortion provider or someone seeking or providing assistance in securing abortion care is sued under another state's laws for care provided in New York, New York now allows that person to recover damages. The goal is to deter frivolous lawsuits and to support providers, patients, and helpers in bearing the cost of defending themselves in any litigation. So practically speaking, what this means is that if a, a New York provider is sued in Texas because they provided abortion care to a Texas citizen who traveled to New York to receive that care, the provider could themselves to sue the Texas plaintiff for damages in a New York court. And this could allow the pro provider to recover the cost they incurred defending themselves in the Texas suit, along with any money that the Texas court orders them to pay as part of an adverse judgment. I just want to say, again, also, as with all of these laws, this counterstate protection is new and untested, um, and it lands us in relatively uncharted territory in terms of how states are interacting with one another. So it just remains to be seen how this law and all of the protection laws are going to play out in practice when they're, when they're used. Um, so to finish this section, I just want to emphasize that these shield laws are also just a first step as we anticipate the types of attacks that we'll see in the future from hostile states on extraterritorial care, so care provided outside the hostile states borders. There's obviously much more work to do, both in, in terms of remaining agile in our response to the changing legal landscape, and also in taking affirmative steps to protect and expand access to care here in New York. Um, and one major focus of our work in that latter bucket is passing a constitutional amendment that would enshrine the right to abortion in New York's constitution. So I will pass it back to Ali to speak more about that, as well as the other elements of our legislative agenda for the upcoming session. Thanks, Jenna, and that was great. I want to just put a like explanatory text next to something Jenna said. So you all heard of the Jenna say the words chapter amendments. Chapter amendments, for those of you who do not do legislative work as your primary gig, are a special creature of the New York State legislative process, where the governor uh, the legislature passes a bill and the governor says. I will sign this bill, but only if you agree to these amendments retroactively to the effective date of the bill. Um, and typically the reason that that happens is that bills often pass at the end of session, so the legislature is not there to make the amendments immediately, but the governor wants to sign the law and they will come and make those amendments at the top of the next section, session. Often I call them extortion, but in this case, it's actually a way of really improving the laws that passed. Um, so with that said, you know, as Jenna emphasized, so much of the uh, provider protection packages, while certainly important, is untested. And so the other thing that the legislature did at the end of session was took the first step towards passing a constitutional amendment to enshrine the right to abortion in our state constitution. And that is sort of a surewire fire way of uh, ensuring access for, you know, is ensuring that access is much more durable and that rights are much more durable here in New York. So when the Dobbs opinion, and folks will remember, it was uh, leaked in May and then the actual decision came down at the end of June. And so when that decision actually came down, the legislature came into an extraordinary session to pass in part to respond to some gun control the decisions that the Supreme Court made, and in part to respond to Dobbs and pass an equal rights amendment. So the Dobbs decision made clear that if our rights are not explicitly written down, they can be taken away. And the Supreme Court made clear that it is angling, or at least some of its members are angling at so many of the ways that we've ordered our lives. They're angling at abortion, they just took that down. They're angling at contraception at marriage equality, at trans rights. Some of them are angling at interracial marriage. Some of them are not. Um, so here in New York, we're not going to take any chances. We have an old equal protection clause in our state constitution right now that only protects race and religion. So we are going to update that equal protection clause to be clear that our state constitution covers everyone and that it explicitly protects reproductive rights, both as a matter of equality and as a matter of prevent, preventing sex discrimination. And I'll just hang a flag here and say, in that way, it goes beyond Roe, which hung its hat on privacy. 
and sort of penumbras of privacy in the Constitution, because we're saying actually reproductive rights are about equality, they're about preventing sex discrimination. So the ERA here in New York is uh, often said not your grandmother's ERA. It is a truly intersectional ERA that would prohibit discrimination based on a person's ethnicity, national origin, age, disability, and sex, including sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, pregnancy, and pregnancy outcomes. It also explicitly protects reproductive autonomy and access to reproductive health care. Here I'll repeat again, you didn't hear the words race and religion because they are already in the Constitution. So we are adding to that list. Um, what we've learned from the Dobbs decision, if we didn't already know, is that when we want to hold our government accountable, we need constitutional language to tell the government where the limits are. And that's what the Equal Rights Amendment will do. So the way that the procedure works here for an amending a constitutional, for amending the Constitution in New York, is that the provision has to pass the legislature twice in two successive legislative sessions, and then it goes to the ballot. So the legislature gave first passage to it, I believe on July 1st, but don't hold me to the exact date. It will give second passage to it, fingers and toes crossed and um, call your legislator. Hopefully at the beginning of this coming legislative session, that is what we're pushing for. And then it will be on the 2024 ballot. So this is your warning now, and we'll be warning you again much closer to in 2024. Remember to flip your ballot over and look at the ballot questions and vote yes on the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, too often in New York, because we are not accustomed to having ballot measures on our ballots, we don't always remember to flip over our ballots. So let's for sure do that. The other thing that is really important for guaranteeing access to abortion, legal abortion is only meaningful when people have actual access, and that means the ability to pay for care. So in May, anticipating the Dobbs decision and anticipating that we would see an influx of patients from other states traveling to New York, which spoiler alert, indeed we have. Uh, in the months since the Dobbs decision, New York has seen 1,500 more patients than we would have expected to see if not for the Dobbs decision, per New York Times reporting. But in May, Governor Hochul allocated $35 million of state funds to abortion access. $25 million of that money is to expand provider capacity, and $10 million is for security grants to providers. Now it's worth just saying that's one-time funding and it's focused on providers who are only one piece of this puzzle. So in the coming legislative session, in addition to second passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, we are going to be focused very strongly on passing the Reproductive Freedom and Equity Fund, which would create a funding mechanism through the State Department of Health to provide grants to abortion providers and abortion funds. These are the organization that make the right to care a reality for people seeking abortion. That's a durable fund, that's a sustainable fund that's year after year. And so that's a top priority this legislative session. I'll give you a little bit of a preview of some of the other things that are coming down the pike because certain legality, certainly legality, provider protections and funding are only a small, piece, small pieces of the puzzle. So we are in looking this session to look at how we can expand, sorry, we're looking to look. We'll work on the wording next time, sorry, recording. Um, but we're expand, looking at ways New York can expand training for providers. We're looking at ways to expand access, including through requiring SUNY and CUNY campuses to have medication abortion available in their health centers or to have partnerships with local clinics to ensure that their students have access to medication abortion. We're also looking at things like hospital transparency, requiring the Department of Health to collect information from general hospitals about their quote unquote policy based exclusions. Those are exclusions that are not grounded in sound medical science, but rather in bureaucratic decision making. We don't provide abortion here is one of those, although we do, or we don't treat, uh, we don't do, we don't. Um, Oh my gosh, do tubal ligation after C-section might be another one. Words, I'm so sorry, y'all, it's a Friday. Uh, uh, Policy-based exclusions also look like not providing care to particular types of people. So we provide hysterectomies for cisgender 
patients with women with cancer, but not to transgender patients who need a hysterectomy for gender dysphoria. So it goes beyond abortion, but certainly within the abortion space, requiring Department of Health to collect that information and publicize it does two things. One, as people travel to New York for care and as New Yorkers have to find care within the state with longer wait times at clinics, they'll be able to know whether a hospital in their area provides the care they need before they call and before they show up. And second of all, and perhaps more importantly, it will help the Department of Health to identify healthcare deserts in the state and particularly how they have an impact on the various communities in our state, particularly poor folks, folks of color, um, folks who are alienated from the healthcare system to begin with. And when we know what regions of our state don't have any access to abortion care, don't have other types of care, the state can put in place other policy solutions. So that's a piece of the puzzle as well. And we continue as we move forward to look at all of the ways that we can expand out care in the state and make sure that we are providing care, abortion care, um, for every person who comes to New York or who is in New York and needs that care. So I will stop here and open it up for questions. So uh, we have not received any questions as of yet. Uh, if anyone would like uh, our speakers to jump in on anything, I know we still have uh, plenty of time. So any you know particular questions, please put them in the chat. And if anyone from, um, from our subcommittee has any questions, please feel free to chime in. Um, all right, I don't think we, uh, we, I don't think we have any questions so far. You guys have been doing a great job of, uh, of explaining everything. Um, so if you guys um, have a little bit more of the, uh, the substance of information to add, that would be fine. Um, if not, and everyone is now clear and everything is going on on New York State, we can wrap up. Uh, I'm certainly never opposed to giving folks more time back. I think the one thing that perhaps is worth saying, because we have a few extra minutes, is, um, oh, the other thing I should say is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the, the Department of Health guidance that came out about young people's access. There's certainly also focus on making sure that that guidance is, is codified in law. Um, but in addition to the work that we're doing to shore up abortion access, there's a whole cadre of work that we are doing around sex ed in the state, ensuring that every public or charter school student has access to comprehensive, age-appropriate, medically accurate sex ed. And that is both about preventing the need for abortion by preventing unintended pregnancies, as well as preventing STIs. But that's also about um, creating LGBTQ inclusive school communities. It's about it's the only upstream tool we have to prevent sexual violence and sexual harassment before it occurs. We're looking at birth justice measures. We're looking at, at, at increasing access to contraception. So we've been very focused today on access to abortion and that's right and that's righteous and that is of the moment. But we do want you to know that we have a holistic agenda in New York State pertaining to access to reproductive health care um, that goes quite a bit broader than our abortion agenda. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, I'm on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ali. Um, Jenna, is there anything else that you would like to add just as we're wrapping up, uh, yeah, making our concluding remarks? Yeah, I mean, I think just to Ali's point that the squarely abortion work, you know, is one part of the work that we need to do to protect and expand reproductive justice in New York. Um, you know, it's also worth mentioning that families who support their, you know, their children um, receiving gender affirming care have been similarly under attack around the country in similar ways that um, abortion has been under attack. And so, you know, as we head into the next legislative session, I think, you know, Senator Hoylman has a great bill introduced that would expand some of these protections that we talked about today to also protect um, families and, you know, providers, seekers, helpers in the gender affirming care space. Um, so another, you know, as we think about what it means to be a healthy family with access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care in New York. I think that's 
a critical piece that we include in the conversation. So we have a raised hand. Uh, so um, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but I think it's Yui. I'm going to allow you to speak right now. Uh, one second. Uh, okay. So go ahead. I'm so sorry. I actually don't have a question. I, I might must have like, um, I'm sorry. I actually don't have a question. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Um, okay. Thank you so much to uh, both of you and thank you for everyone who attended and uh, I hope that this was interesting and informative and we are looking forward to hopefully seeing some of you in uh, two weeks um, on the 18th to hear about what's happening in New York City uh, with access to abortion care. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Bobby. Yes, thank you.